Welcome, Samir. Happy to have you here on Rybarian Radio. Um, Thank you. It's a pleasure. I'm excited for this one. I think it's going to be a, a fun chat. So maybe we'll get started uh, a little bit of an introduction. You can tell us uh, who you are and, and what you do. Okay. Um, well, I'm a, a manual osteopath and therapeutic nutritionist, but prior to that, a long time uh, martial artist, uh, former professional uh, fighter, former professional uh, Muay Thai champion, and long, long time ago, Jiu Jitsu champion. Um, and I practice, I'm a clinician, so I've been working in a clinic, clinic uh, treating patients here in Ontario. So probably started in 2018, kind of uh, my residency and actually just <laughs> graduated in February with my own uh, basic license. But I work directly under uh, medical doctors, so psychiatrist, uh, general practitioner with a specialty in chronic pain, and also uh, some orthopedic surgeons. So that's basically what I'm doing right now. Fantastic. So yeah, you kind of mentioned um, the long time martial arts journey. So that, that was something I, I kind of wanted to start off that I'm interested to hear about because just from, from what I know about you, um, that's kind of... Um, how I met you back sort of in, uh, what was it? 2010 ish kind of around their area. Um, I was kind of fresh out of high school looking to do some martial arts training and, and, and found you through, um, just kind of looking, looking up stuff and started my, my Muay Thai journey with you. Right. So yes. that's kind of, that's the Samir that I came to know. <laughs> right. So just kind of curious about how that journey unfolded for you, your martial arts journey, working security, um, because I had, I think it's like you had a whole different, different life before what you're doing right now. So, uh, uh I'm interested to hear a little bit about that journey. Well, I, I, uh, you were a pleasure by the way to, to train. You're one of the original OGs just so everyone knows out there. Peter's the real deal. We, uh, we trained in a kind of a more of a hardcore environment back in the day very private, very uh, small school. Uh, yeah, um, I've been training since uh, I was young, since I was like six or seven, started in judo. Kind of the story that I hear with many people, you know, they, they started in judo or some sort of martial arts, but they fall off. I didn't fall off, so I continued judo until I was a, a brown belt and then just switched into hapkido and traditional jiu-jitsu. Um, becoming a black belt fairly young, um, just continued to train. And then, um, you know, after I got my black belt in jujitsu, I, I moved into shoot wrestling. And what I did was at each part of my martial arts journey, I wanted to master or at least come to a level, which would be considered uh, like a black belt. If they didn't have a black belt, um, have a title, like, which was like a coach, but but be official. And uh, so I would just immerse myself uh, in each art. And eventually that brought me to fighting. So, uh, and back then, you know, especially in Ontario, you couldn't fight. So the laws have changed now. We have MMA and all that. But back in the day, back in uh, pre-UFC, so there would have been, what, 93, 94, UFC came about, right? Yeah, 93, so before, yeah. I think it was yeah, the first so one. For those times, we would... Um, set up fights and uh you know just another a little another, sketchier uh, a little yeah, sketchier a little sketchier we call them smokers right <laughs> yeah yeah um but that was my my journey you know always always doing a martial arts um and then in i think it was uh, 92 um that was my segue to actual security so just kind of serendipity just happenstance um i was a waiter back then at red lobster and uh i was serving the guy that i was serving said uh i really like the way you present yourself the way you you know you talk have you ever thought of bouncing i didn't even know what bouncing was but that i'm just meant. picturing you in the red lobster outfit right now it's pretty hilarious <laughs> with the apron and everything little, uh, you got it. Uh, yeah eating, eating cheesy buns and yep. um that's literally was my introduction to security um, at the lowest possible level of understanding security, like a literal bouncer, what everyone would think is a bouncer. And then 
from there, just um, meeting people, networking, actually, uh, there was programming at that time, believe it or not. Um, Griffin Group International was working out of Toronto, um, trying to remember the campus, but I, I literally went to university and did courses in risk management and security. And they said, forget everything you think you know about fighting and martial arts has nothing to do with security. And this um, is not Roadhouse. No, you are not Patrick Swayze. <laughs> well, actually, you know, if you remember Patrick Swayze's attitude, you know, like be nice, be nice, use your words. Yeah, totally. uh, so actually, it was like we 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 dive deep, and that was uh, kind of the way I moved through security for 25, 30 years, um, just moving up up. Uh, the ladder going from like a bouncer to a security guard. And as Ontario laws changed, they had the security draft. I think it was in 2015. So like they discarded anyone that had uh, about, I think there was like 89 indictable offenses or charges. And if you had any kind of criminal record, <clears throat> you could no longer do security. So that wiped out the industry. Like, yeah, by for half sure. Overnight. Because it was just a bunch of tough guys kind of like who yeah. didn't really want to do anything else except, you know, give have an excuse to beat some people up maybe, right? Yeah, yeah, it was terrible. Actually, uh, uh, I've never had that mindset. Um, I'm kind of from a traditional uh, mindset. You don't kick them when they're down. Like all those kind of gentlemanly man roles. <laughs> yeah, that's just, I've always been that way. And uh, it would turn my stomach literally seeing some of these guys like the way they would just like literally from the collar and the pants and right through the door like into the door to open the door like like typical stuff like that so just uh there there was an evolution there was a revolution evolution of security i i believe locally here in hamilton and then in toronto i was part of that change um dramatically um affecting the industry um and becoming an instructor, so uh, becoming use of force instructors, certified uh, at a fairly high level, uh, teaching baton and handcuffing and takedowns, uh, like tactical uh, tactical use, and that's where my martial arts kind of uh, kicked in. So having real life experience, like uh, Muay Thai, really helps with you know, the clinch and being close quarters, you know, like Muay Thai specifically helped me when it came to striking, if I had to strike, which you don't really want to do because that's just a whole bunch of problems when you actually hit yeah. people that are still trying to hurt you, but somehow you can't hit them back. You know, it's like, it has to be like absolutely justified. So I think where everyone would think Muay Thai kickboxing with, you know, elbow strikes, knee strikes, clinching would be violent. It's actually the opposite. It gives you so much control to actually determine whether you're going to strike someone. And um, I mean, yeah, people forget about that. I think about with Muay Thai, like how uh, it's all about that, you know, securing that clinch and that that neck control. That's a totally different. There's a lot of wrestling involved in that, right? It's not absolutely. just about the striking and the sweeps in there, right? So there's a yeah. lot. So it just depends. Like if you're familiar with Muay Thai. Um, there's different schools. So some schools will specialize in knee strikes, some specialize in elbow strikes that they're literally, you know, the art of eight limbs, they literally um, take one part of the body and they really work it. So you can kind of recognize different schools in, in what they uh, work on. Ours was a lot of clinching. We always had clinching, clinching arrest because of my wrestling background as well, right? jiu-jitsu, wrestling, shoot wrestling. So that just came natural. But moving into security, it was like, that was just so straightforward. And because of of so much sparring and actual fighting, I actually know the difference between, like if you go to a use of force course, it is so like almost lame. If you just go to a traditional use of force course, mm. like it's brutal. It's really brutal. Like you're going to walk away with your certificate, but you have not done anything real. There's yeah. no like real true resistance. You come train with me. There's always resistance, right? Controlled, progressive resistance. So you can actually feel how this stuff works. So bringing that Muay Thai uh, clinch in there was a game changer where literally I could teach guys in a very short amount of time. Boom, you know, control and leverage the neck and head where the head goes, the body goes. There's your takedown. Right. You, don't, you don't need fancy stuff, right? So that came in really handy, that kind of fusion of, of Muay Thai 
and uh, wrestling. But then the takedown part, that's where the jiu-jitsu would come in. And that came very handy. And it was my switch from Japanese jiu-jitsu um, to Brazilian jiu-jitsu. So I made that switch officially, well, I guess it's been 23 years, 2000. Because uh, I switched to uh, Pedro Viena um, jiu-jitsu. So that was about 23 years ago. I was like traditional and then got my ass kicked from <laughs> like a blue belt. And I, I think at that time, I don't know, I was like a fourth degree or something in, in regular Japanese jiu-jitsu. And mm -hmm. I was like, okay. Uh, the only thing that saved me was my judo background, right? So, uh, but it's that resistance training, wrestling, Muay Thai, Brazilian jiu-jitsu. You, you can't fake it. You cannot fake it. Like you, you either can do it or you can't, you can do an arm bar or you can't, you can make someone tap or you can't, you can escape or you can't, there's no, like, there's absolutely no question. Mm -hmm. um, so I was able to incorporate like, uh, the takedowns and control without hurting anyone. And that actually made me very successful and, um, actually increased my income. So believe it or not, I was able to ask for a higher fee, uh, because I didn't hurt anyone. So less lawsuits, less problems, the no charges, right? Just from having that real time sense of control without having to strike someone. Sure. I mean, that's, I mean, that's what any employer would want, right? Like they don't want problems. They want less, less problems. They want things yes. to be handled clean and efficiently. Right. Yeah. So that makes total sense. And I can see totally how Muay Thai would be a big help there um, compared to maybe someone who just had maybe just jujitsu alone, right? Where it's just everything is kind of on the ground mostly because I mean, the last place you'd want to be on the floor of a club is, is on the ground, like pulled guard on somebody where his friend is going to come over and kick you in the head. Right. That's, yeah, that's not well, where I've, you want to be ideally. No, I've seen it happen actually. Um, so there a couple high level jujitsu guys, one, one, whom I, I won't name. Um, I've run into actually some high level MMA guys with a heavy jujitsu background. Their, their stand ups not that great. And uh, I've seen them run into problems. I've actually had to escort some of these people out from the bar this is more in Toronto. Uh, but there was a couple of situations where even people that trained under me, um, used their jujitsu skills, but they, they were on the ground in the, in the broken beer and glass and, and the mess. And I was not happy uh, with that. So I really focused on them understanding. Yeah, jiu-jitsu is awesome if you get the guy. I mean, I'm a, I'm a Brazilian jiu-jitsu black belt. Of course, I think jiu-jitsu is awesome. <laughs> but I'm realistic in the yeah, sense. Time and place for everything, right? Oh, my goodness. Yeah, like you're fighting for your life. Wherever you end up, that's where you end up. But it's not the first place I'm going to go. I've had jiu-jitsu people because it's more common now, right? You just don't know who you're coming up against. And I had a guy drop down. So I was, we were escorting him and he actually dropped down and tried to tuck in and do like a, a De La Hiva hook with a slag on my, like, it was just weird. Like a bear and bowl, you know, when they, they flip their body around. Yeah. Yeah. So he, he tried to come underneath me and I literally said out loud on the stairs as he was like tucking under me, I'm like, no chance. That's what he said. I said, no chance. And I, and I sprawled out and I, you know, I, I cleared the leg, like all technical stuff. But he, he didn't hurt. think he wasn't expecting that. He wasn't expecting that. He was thought you're just some goon probably. Right. Oh yeah. For, for sure. That yeah. was, I've had a couple episodes. I know I came up against, um, a Georgian wrestler, an older, an older fellow. I knew these guys were wrestlers. They were like, um, three or four of them, older men, late 40s, 50s, and just like built, you know, like muscles coming out of their ear, big, like hairy, like what you would yeah, picture. That old Hollywood. school, old oh, school, yeah. like Eastern block kind of strength, yeah. like old, old man strength. That's uh, oh, yeah. very unassuming, but pretty scary. Right. And I, and I had the radar, my radar was on, I'm like, one of these guys is going to trip out. And uh, he had like a big, heavy cauliflower ear. And actually he, we, we had some trouble. He had, he was being escorted out and then he started to mess around 
with one of the guards who was a big guy and just kind of like head snapped him easily. Just like head snapped him right to the ground. And I'm like, okay, <laughs> this, this is bad. His friends didn't do anything. They they were just watching. And then he, he went to shoot, shoot in on me. I don't think going back to like, they don't expect you to know anything. And I sprawled mm -hmm. like hard, like the hardest I could. Because, you know, sprawling for your sprawling. life here. Yeah, I was sprawling for my life. Yeah, almost was able to uh, lid turn me, right? Like he was almost able to turn the corner. Uh, but I mean, it was my reputation. I mean, there were there must have been a hundred people out there. And um, I was able to like uh, pancake him. And then I took him into like a kind of a, a scarf hold and flipped. And actually because of his wrestling, I don't think he really understood. Like he was on his back at that point, mm -hmm. trying to bridge. And I had got him in an Americana and and drove it until it popped and then he said okay 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 and i and i you know said some expletives <laughs> he was like yeah. i will rip it off yeah if you do anything and his friends didn't jump in so that was pretty stuck because it was just one on one and uh so i let him go and I, I i stepped away and he got up and he didn't even give me a backward look he just walked away with his friends so i've got like tail, tail between his legs yeah i've got experiences like that where like people don't realize that there are some very very dangerous people very unassuming very dangerous people uh, and most of the time they mind their own business i really believe that like <clears throat> for sure I've, the only time i've run into these uh type of of people is actually more mma guys it's MMA guys. They're they're fresh. Like they're not experienced. They might have had one or two amateur fights. They're super young. Just kind of more uh, testing out their their oats. Um, yeah. I've never run into maybe like I said uh, there was two or three in Toronto that if I said their names, which I'm not going to, you would you would know who they are. After the call, yeah. we'll talk about that. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, <laughs> I'm just like, dang, <laughs> what's going on here? <laughs> Yeah. Uh, yeah. For yeah. me, for the most part, especially people that come from more traditional backgrounds, if they're more experienced or whatnot, they're not looking to prove themselves at the club. No. They've already proven themselves in, in the gym. Right. So they're not looking, they're not looking for trouble. Right. So that's typically, you know, it's, it's going to be the loud mouths and whatever, like that's, those are the people that, you know, probably don't really have any real serious training for the most part. Or like you said, they're just young and they've just started out and they're just looking to kind of prove themselves a little yeah. bit, right? Yeah. You can tell a lot by how the how a person is is acting, especially obviously someone like you who has all that experience. I mean, I'm sure you could probably read the person pretty quickly um how it's about to go down, right? Yeah, for the most part, yeah. <laughs> I awesome. I have to say um I've been very fortunate. Um it was only early in my career um where I didn't have that complete sense of mortality. Um I I went into every shift with no sense that I could die. Um, and then once I had a couple of scrapes, I had a couple of bad situations. Uh, I got beat up pretty bad by large groups of people. Like mm -hmm. I never had like one person just mop the floor with me. Um, but I've been in situations where I took it for granted and I had two, three, four, five guys, um, you know, uh, start to fight me. Yeah, just in chaos, right? It's it's such yeah. an uncontrolled environment. You don't know how it's going to pan out. No, no. It doesn't matter how skilled you are. Like things can turn bad quickly, right? Correct. And um, but once I got my teeth into that and started to understand, listen, every shift is a dangerous shift. Everyone, you have to be like. There's no controlled environment. The difference is when someone says, "Are you scared?" They uh, if they have no fighting experience, they don't understand. Like it's just it's a weird question. Like, it's not a straightforward question. There's a physiological chemistry that happens. And when when we are in a, an environment that's not controlled, if you're scared, you will die if you're scared, you know. So you have to, like, kind of intake. So you're not telling someone arrogantly, no, I'm not scared. It's I understand the unknown creates these physiological changes. If you're just an average citizen, you call that fear. Mm -hmm. What I call that is evolutionary. So I know, you know, norepinephrine, you know, adrenaline and, 
you know, there's all kind of chemicals suffusing your blood and it is preparing you to run away from the tiger, to fight the tiger, or to stay as still as possible so that the tiger doesn't see you, right? And so I know that's not fear. And then, and then I have the training. I train it over and over and over, uh, mentally framing when those things happen and heart rates going on, you know, you're moving into that sympathetic nervous system, that is not fear. That is the beauty of evolution. This is how your body prepares to rock and roll. Uh, so do I get do I get that? Yes, I've gotten that. But I had the tools and the training. So early on, I didn't have that. I didn't know. I thought it was fear. And my right leg would always shake. It was just like, I, I would wonder, does everyone else see my leg shaking? But I don't think anyone saw my leg shaking but it was like <laughs> doing like this wagging like a tail and then moving onwards where there was actual machetes and golf clubs and, and and guns coming out this more in toronto none of that like no shaking just because you know training kicks in and you just have to act you just you just got to know what to say or you got to be the first one to move you the first one to take action and sure after there's such a dump of of chemistry you know you go oh yeah into that adrenaline wild. dump yeah but um well the, for I, sure like that's that's it right that's um right there's a difference between you know ha having fear in terms of those physiological responses and sort of um you know being a, a coward so to speak right like you're 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 learning back you're going back to your your training your understanding how you're feeling that's your that's your survival kicking in like you said evolution that's people don't realize that 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 comes from a place of, of keeping us alive. Our, our brains and our, our bodies were designed to keep us alive, not really to keep, not to thrive in the modern environment. We were made to survive 10, 10, 10 you know, 2 million years ago, whatever it was. Um, so that, yeah, that's, that's really important. I think for people to understand is, is, is learn about that fear, learn about those, that physiological process. Cause once you understand it, it kind of takes away some of that, that power, right? Definitely. I mean, um, unfortunately, I've been, you know, I work under uh, one of the medical doctors work under as a, a psychiatrist. So, you know, uh, people that are coming to me don't understand, like everyone is suffering from, we call it GAD, like generalized um, anxiety, right? So everyone has this, this dysfunction, but it's because they, they are not respecting evolution, right? They don't know that you know, we are not meant to, you know, you can't always be in this state of stress, like it has to come down. But uh, evolutionary wise, that's how we're set up. Suffuse the blood, uh, the, 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 the body with all these chemicals, so you can have one of those reactions. And then it has to come back down. Because otherwise, you stay inflamed, and your brain stays inflamed, your tissue stays inflamed. And that's where chronic uh, disease comes in. So if people would actually just understand that that's a physiological response and you have to learn how to turn the physiological response on and off or, or how to internalize what's, what's going on. Because if it's always on, you, you know, you get into hypervigilance where like you can't even tell what's a danger, what's not a danger, you know, which I've gone through that stage as well where i used to think you know after uh, you know a um, high level fight or high level problem risk at work i'm like up here for three days i didn't know how to turn it off i was in code red i'm trying to remember the guy that invented it it was that uh gunman from uh uh i can't remember it's a code you know where you're it's like white yellow orange red in terms of your uh, it, stress levels? Uh, in terms of, yeah, like uh, how we are prepared. So like okay. most people, most people live in the white, in this code white. So they do not believe, nor even do they conceive that something bad can happen in them. So we would be in code white now. Okay. This mm -hmm. would be okay to be in code white. All right. Mm -hmm. We're in our homes. We're with our family. We're in a safe environment. 99.9% percent chance that something awful could happen is pretty slim so that's code white the the moment you leave your home most people don't leave code white you need to move to code yellow and that is the possibility not being paranoid 
uh, not being aware. aware. Just being aware. Just being aware that when you leave the house, you're not in a controlled environment. Mm -hmm. And that is so important for someone to be able to make that switch. Code yellow is when I go to the grocery store. My brain's always on. In a very, you know, just controlled manner, I know that, you know, someone, there could be a high takedown for shoplifting. I've seen it. It happens. And I could be in the way if I'm not paying attention or being on my phone. Um, when I'm going to the bank, if the Brinks truck is there in the bank and they are doing a, a pickup or drop off, I'm code yellow. I stay in my car till they're done. Most people don't do that, right? Mm. They see a truck. It doesn't even occur to them that that Brink truck, um, someone could be trying to take the money. Like that is where it's most vulnerable, right? Is that being me paranoid or overcautious? No, I'm just doing math. Like I just got to wait five minutes. Mm -hmm. I know the chances are slim, but in code yellow, you start to recognize those kind of things. Situational awareness is what we call it. And then, then there's code orange. And this is the juice. This is how martial artists fail and all your training just, just fails is if you cannot make the switch. Okay. So when you're in code orange, you mentally have to go through what you're going to do. You ha there has to be an indicator, a trigger. So uh, my trigger is when someone comes within my arm's reach that I don't know. I can't react after they do it. All I know is that throughout my life, every day, no one comes face to face with me. That is not a normal behavior. Mm -hmm. So if someone comes within my space, I already know what I'm going to do. I already know, which is I'll either strike or do a tick, but I've already mentally gone. I know this. I've known this for years. I already have a plan when someone does that. And then code red is you execute, you do it, boom. So you've got to be able to go through these uh, phases and they got to be turned up and turned down, turned up and turned down. I don't think the average citizen is doing that. They don't, they can't even conceive that. And that's why when we watch the news, that's why maybe ex your experience as well, or you know people, they are totally taken off guard mm -hmm. where I'll give you 30 years and only in the beginning of my career was I caught off guard. Otherwise, I just don't get myself in those situations because of this situational awareness. So I protect my my family, my wife, my kids. I'm I'm always on top of it, and I am not I'm not suffering like heartburn or something. I'm it's I'm really I'm just chill. I just yeah. know there's a possibility. That's all. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Oh, th oh, that's that's so true, Len. I think a lot of people because that's that's something just like that anyone can benefit from just having an idea of this kind of framework. Um, you see it all the time. People just, I see it like I'm when I'm just for another example, when I'm just, I'm driving, right. And you see someone just start walking across the street. Didn't even make eye contact with me as a driver. No concept like, Oh, the green light. Oh, it's a red light. Oh, it's time to walk. They don't know if I'm paying attention or not. Right. They don't know if I'm a drunk driver. Why what, they don't, don't even look. And that's just, and that's a perfect example of just being in, you know, level white. Right. Right. Yeah. And just Cooper. completely. What's Cooper. that? Cooper's color code. Cooper. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> nice. I'm going to look yeah. into that after but <laughs> that. That's super important. And also I think, um, another sort of example, um, and I'll kind of maybe throw my wife under the bus a little bit here with this one. <laughs> um, but you know, she, she is a very, um, angry person behind the wheel of a car, right? And this is one I see all the time. This is, these are the videos that you see uh, on social media all the time, road rage type situations, right? And the people that get out of their car to fight are never, I think I've maybe seen one video where they actually look like, okay, these guys actually, you know, have some training or something. And it was kind of funny. Um, they kind of both realized that they had training and it kind of just neutralized pretty quickly. But most of the time you see people get out of their car to have some kind of a road rage incident. They're just swinging all over the place, falling all over the place, totally overcome by their emotions. Right. Um, and it's just such a crazy thing to, to get out of your car, to confront someone and you have no idea who they are, what they are. 
if they have a gun, like especially in the States, right? Um, the chances of them having a gun are, are much higher, right? It's just and, – and, and someone like my wife who gets so angry. She's never gotten out of the car to fight someone. But it's like still, you don't know this. You could honk this person and flip them off or whatever, and they could be an absolute psychopath, and they could follow you home. Or they yeah. could follow you to the grocery store when you're by yourself and you have no concept of violence and what could happen to you whatsoever. You have no training, no idea. Right. And it's like people are just walking around with just no understanding of, of violence and, and the risk that, you know, comes from everyday situations. And it, like you said, it's not about being paranoid. It's just about being aware. Yeah. This, this reminds me, I was doing, I was at a police academy in Livonia, just outside Detroit, just, like hardcore, like a super hardcore area. Like they're having a hard time in Detroit, right? And uh, so I, I was lunch break, so I was doing defensive tactics, and um, I didn't understand the lights. Like you can turn on the left. Does it have to flash? Like just the way the setup was, I actually was quite confused. So I was waiting. I was waiting for it to turn green, and. I, I could see in my mirror a couple cars down and one of the cars kind of come out like this and was like honking his horn. And I was just nervous because, you know, when you're in the States, uh, if you if you can't pay the take or do you go to jail? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I was sure. just nervous. Unfamiliar right? environment. Just automatically, you're a little bit more on edge, right? Yeah. So and I mean, I've just come from my police taxes training. So I'm all hyped up and stuff. And uh, this is like firearms training as well. So anyways, I, I finally turn and this guy just cuts out and like cuts me off and my alarms are just like, and I literally, the first thing I, I said, I thought to myself, show him your hands. Do not get out of the car. Show him. And I noticed him back there, take his seatbelt off. I noticed that. Mm -hmm. So I was like, this dude's ready to jump out. So it's these little details, right? So mm -hmm. I saw the belt come off. So I'm like, he's he's willing to go but i could tell he was short like he was small so that also told me like all right this is a small fellow took his belt off he's ready to pop out he totally looked like like from a movie like a gangbanger type thing with the you know like the colors and, and stuff yeah. and i'm like oh my god this is brutal i'm at a police defensive tactics course <laughs> lost stuff i'm gonna get shot <laughs> so i i Roll down my window. I put my my hands like this, and I said, "I'm Canadian. I'm Canadian." And he got confused. Like he got out of his car and he stopped. I couldn't see whether you know he had a gun or not, but he's ready. Like he's ready to rock me. And I was like, "I'm Canadian. I'm Canadian." And he was like, "What the fuck?" And I'm like, "I don't know. I didn't know the lights. I'm really sorry, sir." And uh, he's you know he he. He had his words with me, you know, fa 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 fa, and I'm like, yeah, I'm really sorry. I I, I apologize. Um, I will learn better. And, and so he drives off. I go back to the academy, and I'm just like vibrating, right? I'm like, I'm sure I almost just got shot. That's what I was thinking. But if I would have got mad, and I would have been like, fuck you, and got out of the car, and all that, I'd probably be dead today. But when I went back to the academy, and I was telling some of the guys, they're they're all cops like they're like years of experience and they're like oh man that guy didn't know who he was messing with and that was their mindset and i was just like well i don't have a gun and even if i did have a gun that's not my first go-to in a in a car rage thing to get my life ended or to in, get injured or to end someone else's life because of some stupid traffic light like i was actually taken aback surprised by they were just pumped up like we, we had been doing um, light kicks, like defensive tactics to soften up the guy. And I'm like the Muay Thai guy. <laughs> I'm the Muay Thai champion. Like, you can imagine the, the boom. I was moving my partner with the kick, mm -hmm. right? Everyone stopped to see, like, who's that guy kicking, right? Mm -hmm. So that's what they have in their head. That's what they're seeing. And I'm like, no, no, no. That guy was like just a small guy in a rage got out of his car no hesitation we're he's gonna got have some, he's got some confidence hell right? yeah yeah so two, two different mindsets i was not willing to have an exchange of taking someone's life having my life taken or any kind of exchange on a traffic light so you you may have to tell this story to your wife
<laughs> I've had this conversation with her many times. I think it has to come from a, an external third party because I don't think she's going to take my word for it. So maybe I'll show her this combo I'm, after. I'm an expert on these situations. I've, yeah. I've seen them blow up. Golf clubs, machetes, bats, guns, uh, just just yep. ridiculous over nothing. Over and nothing. Unfortunately, people have died mm -hmm. over nothing. Like it's a, sure. it's what I call a stupid death. Like there is no need for someone to die, but they die. So, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, that's, and I think that's where you know you know martial arts training and a lot of that comes into play too. It's like you you sort of get to you understand those things, right? It's the person who's never gotten their their ass kicked that is ready to go because they have no idea what they're potentially what could potentially happen from this, right? Yeah. Um, and they and they're also like like we kind of said earlier, sort of sometimes they might be looking to prove themselves because they're not they haven't proven themselves in the gym. They're not they don't have that sort of confidence. They're they're feeling threatened by everyone around them, sort of thing, right? And that's yeah. something I wanted to to talk about too um, is sort of martial arts and that kind of confidence it gives you. And, and that's something you hear like all the time, like, Oh, you know, put your kid in karate. It gives them, them confidence. Okay. Well, everyone says that, but that's very surface level, but what does that actually really mean? So um, I'll just share with you um, from my perspective, how I kind of uh, think about it and see, see what you think about that. But sure. in terms of confidence, um, I feel like it's another kind of like what we're talking about with a sort of an evolutionary thing, right? So after, um, you know, training and stuff, you kind of realize just having a few years of martial arts experience puts you into like the 1% of the population, right? You don't, you don't realize that, but 99% of people have absolutely no training whatsoever, right? So just having a few years under your belt automatically, you know, puts you in the 99th, you know, percentile, right? So, I always felt like I could walk, um, after, you know, training for, you know, five years or so regularly, I was, you know, comfortable with my skills, especially compared to the average person. Right. Because, um, no matter how, you know, intimidating someone may look, if they're bigger than you, you know, that if, if they have no training whatsoever, like you're probably okay for the most part, because you would see that in training, right. Guys would come in, um, you know, for the first time, maybe they were like a bodybuilder or, or something and they look really mean and tough. And then, you know, I'm like, Oh shit, I got to spar this guy. And then you kind of start moving around with him and you're like, Oh, he, this guy can't move. He can't throw a punch. Like he's big and he maybe looks a little bit scary, but you know, there's, I'm fine sort of thing. Right. Um, so, you know, I could, I could walk into a room, let's say, you know, like a, you know, if going to a big meeting at, at the office or somebody, something like that. And you look around the room and you feel comfortable with yourself. You, there's no, there's no one who's a perceived threat in the room. Right. Um, which is not like a surface level thing. I'm not going to have to fight anybody at the office. Like that's not, that's not the times that we're in. Right. But it's sort of this like old evolutionary, like reptile brain, which starts looking around and seeing who's a threat. And if you feel threatened in some way by someone else, um, it, it has a, an effect on, on your confidence and how you feel about yourself. So it's almost a sort of a calmness that it kind of brings. Like if this situation gets physical, you know, I feel pretty good in this room sort of thing. Right. And that's something that I always, that I found, like when I was younger, I would have this perceived threat, like, Oh, this guy's tough. Oh, well, what am I going to do if this happens? Um, I feel like my brain would just kind of go on, on overdrive a little bit, sort of like with the colors, like you said, right. It would, it would escalate quicker than it needed to. Right. Um, but having that martial arts training and being comfortable with myself and having sort of that, that muscle memory and like a game plan. And, you know, if something were to happen, it never is going to happen in like all these situations at the office or the grocery store or whatever, like you said, but just having that muscle memory and having that belief in yourself that if something does happen, you know, I'm pretty confident in myself, especially compared to the average person. Right. Um, so I don't know what you think about that. If, if that makes sense to you in terms of martial arts. I think it makes a tremendous amount of sense. I, I think you nailed it pretty much and included a little bit of that physiology is, is your physiology changes, your physiological um, action reaction changes. That's, that's actually, if you want to, when we use the word confidence, 
you are gaining a better relationship with the physiology that occurs in that fear, going back to what we talked about. So when we're talking about our kids, we're talking about ourselves, and you know, gives people respect and, and confidence. What does that mean? It's exactly what you said down to the, the chemistry of it. If you keep exposing yourself, so exposure, exposure therapy, if you keep exposing yourself to things that physiologically make you rattled, that get you hyped up, that get too much adrenaline going, that get your heartbeat racing. You cannot think your way through problems. You cannot understand consequences of your action. And you can't be thinking of consequences in the middle of the fight, like you're, you're having that encounter. But leading up to that, <clears throat> when you build confidence, when you build understanding of what is actually going on in your body and you have been exposed to the reality of physical contact, of um, stress, you don't overreact. And it gives you a really calm kind of baseline. And other human beings feed off of that. You pick up on that. You don't even know that you're picking up on that. You'll be, your radar goes on. And you're like, I don't know what it is about this person, but something tells me that is not the person to mess with. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a false comp. They're just relaxed because they know that's how they have to how, how they have to be so they're kind of you know you have that parasympathetic nervous system and sympathetic nervous system you have that system where you're just like digesting food reading a book chilling you know acid production's going on you know heartbeats just like chill mm -hmm. and then you can move right away into that other system where you you are prepared for those you know flight fright or fight but if you can just maintain in between, that's confidence. So when you're trying to figure out what does confidence mean? What does that word mean? Especially with our kids, right? Put them in karate or put them in jiu-jitsu or something and give your kid confidence. Well, that's what you're doing. You're exposing them to stress. You're exposing them to adversity. And the more you expose them, the more they're, they don't jump into that sympathetic nervous system. They actually can stay down here, stay chill. And then even in the challenge or adversity, whether it's physical or mental, they, you know, their heart rate's under control, their breathing is under control, their muscular contraction is under control. So it's probably like, I mean, you, you did articulate it so well. I'm just kind of giving the word confidence. I'm, I'm saying confidence is change of physiology right? Uh, we're actually giving it a physical, what does confidence mean? It means that you have now learned to control those color codes. You've learned to control the physical manifestation of what we would call the opposite of confidence, which is fear or mistaken as cowardice, because it's not always cowardice. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, somebody might perceive it as that, right? But they might not just not have a great understanding of what's really going on. <laughs> yeah, they haven't, they haven't been in the fire Oh, exactly. I mean, there is there is cowardice, in that, and that could be an entire other podcast on the cowardice of what's going on in today's society and in in with traditional roles and in, in men and <clears throat> adversity. But I mean, I don't think necessarily like if you don't have the exposure, if you have a very weak person and they are not exposed to adversity and challenges, they can turn the other way and start to create a form of of cowardice but i think that's more of a a mental state cowardice this is from from their own life traumas their own experiences and, and, and interactions mm -hmm. yeah for sure okay so we're talking a lot of martial arts here i could talk about this all day with you um but uh we've got a lot of other things that i want to get into so let's talk about you know kind of that this change right because you go from you go from being sort of this like warrior archetype right to making a transition to a healer archetype almost right um yeah. in terms of like traditional story archetypes right so I'm, I'm curious to know like was there was there any one moment where you're like you know what like this is gonna i'm gonna transition to this um i don't want to do this anymore i'm more interested in this was there one kind of moment of realization or was it kind of a gradual progression and just sort of a switching of interests would you say uh, well, well, both. Um, the gradual part is I've seen my mentors, my coaches become healers. They start to know acupressure and acupuncture. They start to do coaching courses. And I've always seen that 
uh, gradual transition. Uh, same with me, uh, moving from a fighter to starting to do uh, coaching courses and there's cert certifications that you need, corner men, knowing how to stop a cut, knowing how to get your, your fighter to the next round. You have to start knowing anatomy. You have to know how to stop bleeds. So there's a natural evolution, I believe. I mean, I personally experienced it, but I've seen it where when you're in martial arts, when you're in the combative arts, you learn how to heal because you have to heal yourself. You have to heal your athlete or fighter. So you have to to gain that knowledge if you want to excel, right? So that was a natural evolution of, of, of learning to become a healer, but it was more specific. It was like in a more selfish way. It's like, I got to make sure I can heal my team. I got to make sure I can heal my athlete because I need him to be able to get to this next fight or for him to excel. And then eventually it goes away from that selfishness to more of a broad sense where um, I just found joy in being able to, you know, someone dislocated something or they had a concussion or uh, not even my students, but people would start to know that I know these things and they would they would seek advice. And, and I had kind of an inner pleasure, like it just made me feel so just so good to be able to alleviate someone's someone's pain. So start to move away from the fight game and and. As we're moving to, to, I think it was 2018, um, so genetically, my shoulders and my hips have a particular shape of the joint, right? So genetically. So for the chosen sports, so I'm, I know you know that I'm super flexible and I can do the splits and do all kind of wacky, crazy stuff. Yeah, I may have been head kicked by you at some point in time, so I know <laughs> that uh, the hard way, but yes, continue. <laughs> I'm sure there's a few people that have that experience. Yep. And but what happened is because um over the years um you know being young and just wearing it out hard hard kicker right hard hard kicker uh, not taking rest not healing myself what I did was inside the joint because of the sport I would always go to the maximum of the joint capsule inside my shoulders and inside my hips and because of the particular shape that I have, I wore them out. So it's a combination of genetics and a combination of happening to what my sport was. So when I got to about 2018, I was, I was suffering some like extreme levels of pain. My whole life's been around pain. So, you know, jujitsu is around pain, around submission and learning to, to uh, take pain this was some like crazy pain, like where I would have to stretch and mobilize for like an hour after I got out of the car. So before mm -hmm. my shift, I had to go to work an hour early cause I was driving for an hour. And then I'd have all this like very advanced kind of a stretching routine just to get through my shift. So it was a natural evolution of moving into just from experience, you know, trying to fix people, heal them. And my own realization, you know, that my body was wearing out and um, I'm a skilled pad holder and I'm sure you know how good it is to have a good pad holder versus a bad pad holder. Oh yeah. It's an so, art in its own. Yeah. Yes. So if you have to drive to get that pad work, you will drive to get to that pad work. If you have to pay a little extra, you'll pay a little extra. So I was making quite uh, like a very good living just off of holding pads you can only hold pads so much. So literally by 2018, I, I wore out my uh, right hip and I needed it replaced. Especially because you're holding pads for people that know how to strike, not like some average 15 year old, right? So this, oh, no. that's a lot of wear and tear on your yes. body. And you've seen, I'm sure some of the people that I hold pads for. So I mean, I I've really... just in my own training, for example, I've, I've trained with guys and um, you know, who are fantastic power kickers. And I remember a time specifically where I was holding pads. We were doing kind of uh, a lot of kicks, a lot of sort of body kicks and, and head kicks. And just from holding the pads, I remember getting back into my car and be like, I can't grip the freaking steering wheel because my, because my forearms are just so toast right now. I had to sit in my car for like 10 to 15 minutes before I could really? drive home. Yeah. So that's, that's a lot of wear and tear on the body for sure. Lots. 
And I'm a very interactive uh, pad holder. I just, I'm not the guy that holds the pads like this. I actually move and, you know, like the nice traditional uh, Thai style of back and forth action reaction. So, you know, I wore out my right hip eventually. So I got my right hip replaced. My, my right shoulder was, was wearing out. I couldn't even do like this. I couldn't, I couldn't even put my arm behind. So that was wearing out. Then my left hip was going. I had to get my left hip replaced. Um, I knew I had to get my right shoulder replaced. I was getting injections, you know, those viscous uh, injections uh, to to hold me through. And then eventually I was like, oh my God, like I, I won't be able to do this forever. And then that moment happened when one of my students who was at that time, he's maybe 14 or 15. Um, so he had trained with me and then um, he'd gone away to become a doctor. And then we crossed paths again. Years later, he'd been seeking me out. He'd been seeking me out because he said, I felt the best when I trained with you. That's what he remembered. And he was training with me for about three weeks. And he pulled me aside and he said, I, I don't want this to come out wrong. I don't want you to, I'm not disrespecting you. I think you're your talents are wasted here. And I was like, oh, what What do you mean? He's like, uh, just in my thoughts, I think there's much more that you could offer than what you're doing here. Your knowledge, um, you just don't have the certificates that you need or the diploma or the education. I want to do that for you. I want to give that to you. I want you to come work for me. And that was, I was like, I went home, talked to my wife. And I was like, he really believes in me. He said, I'm wasted. And she's like, you know, people for years have, have, have built me up, right? They're like, you're awesome, blah, blah, this. Uh, but they always want something, right? There's always mm -hmm. like a want something. And somehow, somewhere in there, I'm, I'm not getting paid. But I got to make a living, right? Oops. I got to get paid, right? So yep. um, she was very weary and leery of it. And I said, no, like this is hard. That's the role. That's the role of our partner. I've done that yes. so many times too, where I come, I come in super high on something and my wife brings me down to earth and like, let's look at this logically. Right. That's, that's, uh, that's part of it. Right. Yeah. Well, she, she's my rock for sure. Like she's my rock. She's the, uh, she's the negative to the positive. Like she is the, the consummate pessimist in a constructive way. Like she always just bring it down a notch, Samir, bring mm -hmm. it down. And then me, the opposite, I'm like, bring it up. Come on, girl, bring it up a little bit. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so, so we, we, uh, they walked me through it. She's like, okay, we'll just see what he has to say. And sure enough, they, they put me back in uh, school and I, and I started to take uh, workshops as well. That's how I got introduced to functional range systems. Total game changer. Everyone um, thinks about like, you know, when you're working out and lifting weights and everyone has their programs, I'd never ever encountered um, the concentration on the joint itself. Everyone always talks about muscles and strengthening muscles and flexibility. I'm your guy for flexibility. Like I know, you know, um, I've got my, my, my yoga certificate, you know, but this was like deep, deep science. So when I went back to school, health sciences and, you know, you take, uh, physiology, anatomy, like all, all kinds of different sections under health. I started to realize, wow, this is, this is a game changer. If I can work in a medical setting, I, I'm very confident I can relieve people of chronic pain because they don't move properly. They just get this kind of physio uh, leaflet of exercises to do, strengthening and stretching. But these people are still in pain, right? So as I learned, as I did more courses and then actually became kind of a clinical resident, right? Got to work in the clinic directly under uh, the doctors, then COVID hit, right? And so it allowed um, medical personnel to designate or to, to delegate work under their supervision because we had no one. So COVID actually was quite the blessing. So to come back to your question is like, there was a couple things that made me do the switch. So I was getting educated by the time I got to 2020, you know, I was therapeutic nutritionist, 
Um, I had, I had uh, got diplomas in like physiology, anatomy, uh, degree like health sciences. So I was moving towards where I am now, um, got my hours in working in a clinic. And then I, a, a friend of mine, you know, who was an osteopath, a manual osteopath, and that's like musculoskeletal manual therapy, where without medications, uh, without being invasive, we we stretch you, we mobilize you, we uh, adjust you uh, without the, you know, the high velocity, you know, movement of a chiropractor, but we align and balance through manual inputs and exercises, the body as a whole kind of holistically. And he had called me up and said, you know what? I think you would be ideal to get into osteopathy. They have um, an academy in Toronto where if you are working in a medical setting or you have a medical background or you have the degree or credits, you can transition into osteopathy. And I was like, okay, give this a try. I applied, I passed, um, I study, I continued to study and, um, you know, a couple of years goes by. So this is like 2018 and 2000, where are we? 2023. So it was February where I got my own, um, provider number, right? My own license number. So that's how I did it. I just COVID kind of was like, I had to stop martial arts because my shoulders and hips were done. I fractured mm -hmm. my femur like two, three times because I just, I trained too hard. So I got the hip replaced. I'd stretch, I'd be doing my thing. Boom. I'd, 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 I'd would do something wrong. <laughs> fracture my femur. I don't know if you're familiar with fractures of the femur, but they're, they have that, a fracture or break of a femur and someone old will kill them. Like right. usually it's, it's their decline or their hip, it's their decline in a year, they, they pass away, like it's pretty bad. So that's when yeah. I was like, okay, uh, <laughs> I gotta take a break. I gotta revisit. So I retired, semi-retired from martial arts training. Um, I guess it's been a year. It's almost been two years since I've actually like rolled on the mats. I still interact with people, I actually still do um, I interact with some of my students. I look at their video. I analyze. I do lesson plans. Like I'm still involved, yeah. but just without the um, high impact type stuff, right? Yeah, none of that high impact. I'm planning uh, to go back September to to start to train for myself back on the mats. Um, you know, get my roles in, but just more of a kind of a self journey. My time of like hardcore training large groups and, and monetarily, you know, making my, my money from, from teaching and training. I think that that is gone now. And incidentally, if you run into me, um, it's just like when I see someone that's, uh, you know, been a long time mentor coach, if they want to come and give me a pointer, I'm all ears. Like that's knowledge that you can't grab. So I think that's kind of more of what I'm looking to do is especially in jiu-jitsu like when black belts come around they just welcome you like because i did the mm -hmm. same thing a black belt wanted to come and visit i'm like hell yeah do you want to teach the class like uh, but i think that's where i see my role in martial arts is kind of more of a laid-back old-timer mentor come visit you know have a nice soft role pick and choose my roles i don't need mm -hmm. to prove anything at this point no, uh, you're not um, looking for the the young gun <laughs> college wrestler who's just starting yeah. jujitsu yeah. who's looking to prove himself. That's the person you want to stay away from, right? <laughs> yeah. No, I don't. I don't. I don't need to do that. I'm. I really love what I'm doing here. I am impacting people in large numbers daily. Um, it's just been a wonderful, wonderful experience being in this medical setting. People's lives are changing, and uh, if I die today, I would be uh, satisfied. I would be happy. I mean, we always want to do more. Uh, you know, I I want to keep growing and learning. You know, I'm still in school, and I'm, I'm have a bridge program. I want to get my my doctor's degree. Um, so I do schooling every day, 
Um, but I, I want to do what I'm doing. And I want to be really, I just want to be the best. I really want to be the best. I want to be that guy where when you come see me, I'm going to reduce your pain. I'm going to have an answer for you. And if I can't, if I don't have the answer for you, I will find that answer. I will point you in the right direction. That's kind of my goal. Yeah, that's your, that's the theme. You're just trying to get your black belt in healing now, right? Hell yeah. That's kind of, that's the, <laughs> yeah. that's the theme of your life, right? Just get the black belt in whatever the hell you're doing right now. Pretty um, much. And that's, and that's, that's a really powerful lesson too. I think, you know, like there's a lot of people that maybe if they were in your position, maybe if they are in your position right now, where sort of the thing they've been doing their whole life is just not working anymore. Right. It it's, it's easy to sort of, you know, get down on yourself and get depressed about it. And, you know, people, you know, you see this a lot with like professional athletes, for example, when they don't have their sport anymore, when they retire, whether it's because of injury or circumstances or whatnot, you see thing you see them go downhill really quickly. They start, you know, drinking, doing drugs, partying, whatever to try and, um, you know, just numb the pain sort of thing because their identity is lost. Right. But if you're just, if you're just open to the universe, um, and just listening to, and listening to opportunities coming your way, there's, there's some, some other doors that will open for you. Right. You just have to pay attention and, and sort of be willing to accept change because nothing stays the same forever. Right. Evolution is, goes on. Right. Um, yeah, yeah so that's, I, uh, that's powerful. I, I would like to add to that actually is, uh, reading. I know this will sound random to what you said, but seeing new doors open, accepting those new doors, uh, you know, leaving behind certain thoughts, your career, moving into new careers. Those all I find are affected by research and reading. Believe me, you and they open doors because people may have the degree, the title, the certificate. They do not have the experience. They don't. Uh, and they don't have the reading. So, you know, they do the studies that they were supposed to do to get the title and the job, and then they're done. And I found that new doors opened for me because I'm an avid reader. Um, I just, I'm constantly reading and interpreting studies. Um, and it makes a big difference because it keeps opening doors because I'll be in a discussion networking and then someone will say, oh, I, I didn't know that. And I'll say, oh, and then we just have a, a dialogue and then I get invited to a talk or uh, to a meeting or I get input. So it's, it's all around, it's a door opener. So if there's a message I would give to your listeners or a message in general, is never stop reading, like read. And I, so when I read an author, if I, if I read someone like, uh, say I'll, I'll use an example, like, um, what's his book, the carnivore book, uh, uh, Dr. Paul Saladino. Okay. Yep. Yep. So say H I read his book, which, which, which I've read his book, but then I'll look at his references. This is how, what determines what I will read. He'll make a reference. I'll look at the reference. I'll see if they've authored a book and that's my next read. And that's how I go. So I've always, I'm always in the now of the latest, but I'm also in the background of what's already been written or studied. And so I get like one day I'm reading, you, you know, on certain vitamins. Another day I'm working on, I'm reading on the uh, latest cancer treatment. Like it just depends what's been cited or referenced, but your brain just goes like this and then magically doors just open because mm -hmm. you are the expert. Like you actually are legitimately the expert on the subject that needs to be discussed. So it yeah, opens especially, doors. I mean, I, I think that's especially true in, in, uh, sort of nutrition, right? That's, that's a big one too, because things are always changing. There's always new studies coming out. Even, you know, for example, like you just said, uh, with Paul Saladino and his, uh, his carnivore, like even he, even from the time that he wrote that book to what he thinks now and the way he talks about things now is different because he's willing to change and he's willing to accept new information and tinker and try different things. And because that's what it's all about, right? You see some of these people that whatever they learned in school, you know, in the nineties and the textbooks were from the seventies, you know, that's what they're like, that's it. Like I'm done. Right. And a lot of it, especially we're talking about, you know, if we're talking about sort of your average, um, 
general practitioner physician, right? Um, not all of that is is on them that they don't want to learn. It's a lot of them that they just don't have the time to read because they're no, so they just, don't. our medical system is so overloaded right now um, that they just don't even have the time to read. They're not given the time. They, they got five minutes to see every patient from the second they walk in the door until they leave, right? So yeah. they just don't have the time to stay up on things. They don't have the time to really consider maybe the individuality of every single person that walks in the room, right? Um, so it's partly it's the fault of some people and partly it's also the fault of um, just the system and that they're kind of set up that way, right? Yeah, I agree. Um, yeah. Um, so, you know, going back to sort of the physical side of things, what are some of the sort of the biggest issues that you see with people or, or your patients today? Are there any kind of common denominators that, that you're, that you see, or is it kind of all over the place? Just kind of curious about that. Uh, that they don't make the connection between nutrition and mobility. They're not. So people will come in and kind of the biomedical view is like my shoulder hurts. So then the doctor looks at your shoulder and nothing else. So you could be a uh, raging diabetic. You could be, you could be obese. You, you could have uh, heart disease, but in in the method, they just look at your shoulder. Where that's the biggest challenge is that people come in and they're complaining about the shoulder or their knee, and not making the connection that it's your nutrition as well. Like I can't fix a shoulder if it's made out of straw. That's why I always use the three little pegs. You know, you have a house of straw, house of uh, wood, house of brick. So the architecture is not considered even in the high level training that I've done now for like manual therapy and uh, movements, um, a strength coach. No one talks literally about the architecture of what you're moving in terms of nutrition. No one's talking about nutrition. And osteopathy is an entire section of nutrition, right? Because it's holistic. So when they come in, yeah, I tell them I'm up front. I'm like, do you know how many shoulders I look at in a week? Like it's mind blowing. Everyone has bad shoulders. But then when I look at how they got hurt, what they did wrong. So if this is like your average person that's sedentary, that doesn't work out, they are asking their shoulder to do a movement that the joint can't handle. So it's not their, um, the rotator cuff muscles or their delt or the bite. Like it's not their muscles. It's the literal joint. They're asking their joint to do a certain movement. You know, they might have just reached for something and they, they pull it and they don't make the connection is that you're sedentary. You don't move. So on that day, you know, the stars and moons aligned. You went to reach and you, you damage it because you never articulate the joint. Now, if, if you look at a child, we look at someone that's 12. Um, you know, I just watched my daughter yesterday. She's uh, 13. She was on that, uh, what do you call those things? They climb at the park. With those jungle yeah. gyms or, yeah, you know, okay, she's 13, yeah. her legs here. She did rock climbing a couple of weeks ago. You know, shoulder joint goes like this, back twists like this, turns. You're a child. You are mobilizing your joints all the time. You get to 35 and you're, you're doing your eight-hour job, eight-hour shift job. You don't mobilize your body anymore. But then you still want to be a weekend warrior and do your two days of Muay Thai or, you know, you go to your jiu-jitsu class or on the weekend you smash some weights and you're not making the connection. And then your diet's horrible. Mm -hmm. Right. So the, the greatest challenge for me is to make that connection because it's not a conventional approach. People normally even go to their physio, their chiropractor, the massage therapist. No one's getting discussed. I mean, you can tell me the last time you went to some form of manual therapy where they're asking you what you ate that day. They, they don't. They just listen to what you say. This part hurts and then it gets uh, fixed. Mm -hmm. So the advantage of being in a clinical setting is overcoming that challenge by saying, you know, by working with the doctor and getting some blood work done, looking at the blood markers, if I can't see their blood work, you know, say, say we don't do uh, blood work, I look at their lifestyle and I look at what inflammatory foods they're eating because a lot of people come in, I use the shoulder because it's just so common. Um, everyone has like a frozen shoulder. Shoulders and lower backs kind of you your most typical things. Pain. I mean, I'm literally like, it's the most awesome part of my job. So I've got people that have had chronic back pain, like 10 years, 20 years, 
like they're a mess, okay? They've tried every type of therapy. They're on heavy drugs, medication. I look at their diet. It's brutal, okay? So I just hilarious. I'm just picturing someone coming into you and being like, my shoulder hurts. And you're like, oh, that's great. What did you have for breakfast? Uh, That's hilarious, but it's it's so true. Have you ever heard of it? Have you ever heard of it? It's a different approach, right? Yeah. So, and, and anecdotally, clinically, I see the same thing over and over, you know, lack of protein, but like really, really low protein or proteins that aren't bioavailable. You know, they're all like this newfangled plant-based uh, protein. Uh, they just have like a really terrible diet. And then, so I changed the diet. Guess whose back pain goes away? 10 years, 10 years. And then I get them to do um, um articulation of the joints specifically so i'm not getting you doing like um what would be uh like cleans and squats and lunges and like typical things that we would do to strengthen people i get you to move your spine properly i just get you to segment it i get you to understand you know it has flexion and extension like articulations right i try to get you back in a natural state that you would have had when you were a child i try to recreate patterns that naturally keep you limber at the joint level, not you doing two hour um, yoga sessions, because that's not necessarily practical for you, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's probably the biggest challenge is uh, with patients is making the nutritional connection to what you ate for breakfast to your low, low back pain, or why is your shoulder not healing? Mm-hmm. Of course, there's the physical part. And the, the biggest challenge of like a kind of a physio approach is that they don't know the difference between mobilization and flexibility. So like uh, you might be flexible, but your joint might not support the flexibility. So I have people that are quite limber. They're like yoga people, they're Pilates, they're dancers, and they're injured, super flexible, put their leg behind their head, but there's no control or strength to put themselves in that position. Mm. They don't understand the difference. They just say, well, I'm flexible. I don't understand. Flexibility is like your ability to lengthen the muscle, right? Where mobility is your ability of your tendon and your joint to communicate to that muscle properly. That inside the space of the joint, you have good rotational muscles. Like you've got to work from the inside out. You can't just start, you know, doing your blue band uh, rotator cuff uh, exercises that everyone gets because if that literally worked every time we'd all be doing it mm-hmm. so got to work on your joint first so those are the two things i do people come in i get them over this um they're ignoring their joints i get them to work on their joints the capacity of the joint i increase the space in their joint and then i work outwards into the muscular realm of like more conventional exercises but i don't do conventional exercises until they can show me they can fully articulate the joint for what it was meant to be. And that works for hips, for knees, for ankles, for toes, for your neck, anything chronic. I just look, I do a functional range assessment of your joint. I look at where you are lacking or where you compensate. We fix those. And then we start to move into the strength, kind of strength-based uh, treatment. Yeah, sort of earning earning the right to practice some of those strength movements, right? Not just going yes. right into it, right? Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. So is there kind of for your average person, you know, your desk, typical desk worker like myself, um, you know, someone who's commuting a lot, like you said, you know, like, for example, yourself even had to, you know, you were driving to Toronto, right, having to do a a warm up and a stretch just to recover from the from the, you know, being cramped up in a car like a lot of these things are we can't necessarily avoid them because of you know how modern society is set up right so is there anything that you think that sort of is the most bang for your buck for your average person without obviously assessing their you know individual needs that we could be doing to kind of mitigate some of this stuff yes i actually deal with uh, commuters and people uh, that most of their pain comes from not from them not trying to fix it it comes from they've got to sit that's just the nature of their job to either drive and sit or they're sitting at their, their desk. So I introduce isometrics. So your average person can just isometrically wake up the muscles. So the problem with sitting, uh, you know, you have agonist antagonist, you have like a muscle that tightens and you have a muscle that lengthens and you have muscles like when you're sitting that are just like, say your hip flexors, right? 
like you're always flexed, like you're not, there's no hip extension. And you may not be in a situation where you literally can get up and walk around. If you can, I always say you got to get up. You have to get up. And there's these mobilization exercises that are really low key. I mean, we're talking like a couple of minutes. You just mobilize your hips, mobilize your body. We call it uh, the morning routine, but you can do this routine at any time. And you literally address your joints. You mobilize them, you get fluid moving, and then you can sit back down. But yeah, the number one that I have for like really sedentary people or sitting is to isometrically contract your muscles. You, you would be surprised. So like, for example, see how we're sitting. I would have you like push your feet. Like if you just look at yourself now, the way you feel, you've been sitting for a while, right? Your hammies, your hamstrings are lax. Like we're just lax. Everything is lax. Mm -hmm. So I just get them to push. And you won't believe like now I'm pushing my, my feet into the floor. I didn't even know how sleepy my quads were, my quadriceps, right? And now my hamstrings are waking up. I tighten my belly and I hold it for like 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and then I relax. And then when you relax, you lengthen muscles again. You, you tighten muscles that need to be tight because you need muscles to keep you erect, right? Mm -hmm. And you lengthen muscles that need to lengthen. So I do all kind of isometrics, even myself when I'm sitting here. I do isometrics. I, I would look twitchy if you were watching me or, you know, working away. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm, I'm doing like movements, I'll type a little bit. Uh, but that would be my strongest advice is create a routine that fits your driving and sitting schedule. Learn what uh, isometrics are of contracting the muscles without changing the angle of your joint. When you can move into isotonics, which is changing the angle, right? As you're contracted, um, the more constrained you are at work, the, the, the less you can get up and move around. I would depend on that. But if you can at least get up on, on every hour, five to 10 minutes and do a mobilization routine, I think, I think it's uh, like so far clinically, it's been a dramatic change. Like people are literally like, I got up. I did the exercise, pain went away. Like, and I'm like, I know. <laughs> like, I know that's what's supposed to happen. I mean, that's what even happens in manual therapy is that you have a spasm or you have a, a muscle. It, it People think that contraction or tightness is not good. That's not what the, the issue is when you're trying to fix something chronically or you have a work, is that your muscles, the fibers are either like this or they're actually like this. They're too like them. What you need to fix is this, is the action of when you're sitting to mobilize fibers so that it contracts and lengthens as needed, doesn't sit in one position for eight hours. It's no wonder when you try to get up out of your seat, you haven't had a contraction or a relaxation. It's not balanced. You can't even like straighten out your back, right? But if you've been contracting and relaxing, then you are simulating this movement. So that'd be probably like the number one approach uh, that I would give to like that type of uh, work if you're sitting or driving. Yeah, that's great. Just finding any ways to kind of incorporate movement a little bit more. Um, that's fantastic. I haven't really thought about that too much, just basic isometric con contractions, right? So next time I'm, uh, I'm in a work meeting, I'm just going to be flexing my glutes there, sitting there and nobody's cool. gonna even realize it <laughs> i'm telling you like uh, funny enough yesterday uh one of one of my patients said they were blown away from doing these glute contractions that i told her to do because she had like she has like severe low back pain when it's been a long time almost like sciatica type stuff and so what i said is you got to start squeezing your glutes like you just squeeze your glutes we call them penitentiary glutes where you know because you don't have weights and stuff i don't know if you've ever seen um, the routines in, in the penitentiary, but they'll stand flush to, to the wall and they'll squeeze their glutes. It's crazy. Right. So I started doing those back pain goes away. Like there's, you know, holistically, when you're looking at anatomy, it's easy to be lost in like, say, you know, you're trained, you work out, you isolate muscles, but that's not how it works. There's a bio flow. We call it a bio flow. Everything is literally connected. Mm -hmm. If you think of your buttocks, your gluteus muscles, you know, you know, the three layers and then plus deep hip muscles, 
they're all stuck to each other. Like they're all connected. So yeah, we can like talk to one, kind of, but you're talking to all of it. So just imagine you start doing glute squeezes. That's your entire like core, like say from your belly button into your bikini line. Think of that triangle and you squeeze and then relax, squeeze or relax or take a, do a, a pelvic tilt, right? Where you can go anterior, posterior, right? Like a little, uh, I call it the mojo, right? Like your mojo, your hips, mm -hmm. just like that. So someone might notice if you're doing that at work, but I do it real subtle and I just do like this uh, pelvic work, pelvic tilting. I work with uh, like pregnant people and uh, like uh, pr pregnant, uh, they're not uh, past three months, but I'll do their pelvic tilting work and their pelvic work. Mm -hmm. It's, I'm, I, I'm excited to, to, for you to tell me if, if you can feel the difference of of just isometrics at work or you know talking to other people about it and seeing yeah. seeing it work for them yeah. yeah that's a big one for me because i having to sit for most of the day um especially if i have you know back-to-back -back calls like i can't get up and and walk around sometimes for like a whole afternoon almost right so i know when i when i do finally get up just like my my hip flexors and uh my hamstrings is everything is just so tight um such a terrible terrible feeling. And then especially if I don't, if I'm not on top of it, I, and then I try to do something in the gym, like the other, the other day I was hadn't, hadn't back squatted for a while. I was doing mostly single leg stuff and I decided to, you know, load up the barbell and, and try some, some back squats and just my, my lower back, my, my QL just spasmed like crazy, just was not ready to handle that just cause I was so tight and not, yeah. not good everywhere. And that was, that was a stupid lifters, you know, typical mistake, <laughs> but you know, live and learn. Um, but we all do it. yeah, <laughs> yeah. Anybody who's, who's lifted for a long time, you know, sometimes you just, you just want to load up the bar and, and go for it. Um, when maybe your body's not, not ready and all the warning signs are there, right? The, you look at the dashboard and there's a lot of blinking lights, but you just, you go for it anyways. Right. That's Which right. is not the <laughs> smartest thing. So yeah, like what about like training in terms of sort of the average lifters training program, anything specific that you think that they could sort of add in into the training program for, you know, for general longevity, because you see, I mean, you see some of these um, people who don't have typically any kind of mobility work, they're training their, whether it's, you know, bodybuilding or a lot of power lifters, um, you see how they end up when they're older and it's not, it's not great. I, I remember I had one of these, these moments, um, it was a professional bodybuilder that I was doing. Um, I was doing, creating some content with, I was working for a supplement company and they were in doing a, a photo shoot. Right. Um, and I won't say who it is, but this is like a high level bodybuilder, you know, like Arnold's champion, you know, was a top 10 guy for many years at Mr. Olympia. Right. And, uh, he's having to warm up to be able to do a double bicep pose. And I'm like, that's insane. Like he's having to warm up his shoulders just so he can hit a, a double bicep pose for this photo shoot. Um, and I'm just like, that's, that's crazy. That seems like such a natural movement for an average young person. But like, if you don't really focus on any mobility or anything, this is how you end up when you're older, even though you're like sort of this high level athlete and everyone looks at you like, wow, this guy's jacked. He's, he's great. His body is amazing. Right. But really he can't, can barely do anything. Right. Yeah. Well, I think, uh, you have to incorporate, yeah. First off, you have to uh, separate flexibility from mobility. And basically the easiest way to think of it is think of the joint that you're relying on to gain the movement. So like, say I was doing a, a pec stretch, you know, like just trying to stretch out my pec or trying to get my, my uh, shoulder ready. Well, I need to expand the glenhumeral capsule. I need to make as much space in there. I'll give you an example. I worked out this morning uh, and I was working on my, I was doing the legs. It was just a maintenance workout. So even general population, people doing a general uh, physical upkeep should have like their maintenance mode and then uh, specificity in the sense of what are, what do you want to achieve? Know what their maximum lift is, you know, stuff like that. Um, but then once you, we, once you figure that out, you have to, like, if I want to work, I worked on my knees, I worked on my ankles, I worked on my hips. 
So in between sets, I did mobilizations. Before I even started working out, I did mobilizations. I mobilized to the full capacity of what can my hip do in all its articulations. So I articulated whatever the joint is designed to do, I maxed it out. I took it to its greatest maximal movement. And then I did that for my knees. I did that for my ankles. And then I would do my workout. And then even between the workout, I would do some isometric, isotonic uh, movements. We call it like kin stretch, where we're, we're now we're moving into flexibility, like using the mobility with the flexibility. So when I see people at the gym, my general advice would be to them to incorporate mobility and not as fluff. It is a must. Because if you can't, you know, do a double bicep, folks, there's yeah. some, there is some deficiencies going on. It has to be at the forefront of your training for longevity. It wasn't in mine, and I suffered for it. So now I'm a big proponent of it. It was life-changing. I literally told um, uh, uh, Dr. Andrea Spina, the creator of Functional Range uh, System, I, I told him, you saved my life. And he, and he wasn't surprised that so people tell me that in a very like humble way, but I'm kind but of a big deal, you know, <laughs> <laughs> no, literally he was like really kind, you know, we've, we've spoken and I said, no, you literally, you saved my life because I thought it was all about yoga and stretching and being flexible. And I, I, and I ignored the joints. So if you're going to go work out and I'll do like some tests on you, but if you weren't able to test yourself, uh, you have to make sure that your hip joint, if you're doing squats or lunges, you have to make sure that your hips can can do what you're asking them to do. So when you work out, if you're loading a joint, but the joint can't move in its full articulation, you really technically should not be doing that exercise. Like say um, say a shoulder press, okay? So if I do a shoulder press and you have pain, in the front here, like you're going like this. And I noticed from the side, you're a little bit, you're actually a little bit tilted forward because you actually don't have not flexibility. You don't have the joint. There's no space in there. So let's do that for the next 10 years and see how you wear out your joint. And you do have rotator cuff muscles where we could have fixed that mm -hmm. just by showing you that you've got more space in the joint, right? So just a joint, uh, just addressing different joints in the body, ensuring that they can support the physical activity that you want to do at the gym and then consistently and constantly working on it. So it's not something that you don't work on. And then once or twice, just like you would use for say, uh, hypertrophy, like some, some form of, you know, whether you want to get stronger or bigger, you work hard, right? You work real hard. Mm -hmm. So it should be at least one day, if not two days a week where you address your joints and you pick a joint, and you max effort it. You like you just try to expand it. And if you are at a point where you have full expansion of what you need for your sport and your wants, you're like, no, my shoulder's good. It moves in all the places I want to. Um, then you need to strengthen it. You need to now start strengthening the red stuff, the, the muscles that support that joint. So that would be my approach. That's great. And I'll still check to see what you had for breakfast. <laughs> yeah, of course. Uh, the big picture stuff, right? Um, yeah. Yeah. And that's, that's so important too. I think, I think, you know, when you're young, when you're a, you know, a teenager and in your early twenties, you get away with all this stuff, right? Yep. Um, and then sort of, and, and, you know, a lot of people, that's where kind of their lifting career ends for a lot of people. They stop working out, they get married, they have kids. They're not really super active anymore. Maybe they play some rec sports here and there, but they're not as dedicated. Right. Um, but for someone like myself, for example, who's, you know, just in love with all of this stuff and wants to do it for life. Now that I'm, I'm in my thirties now, it's like, Oh, now I have to start paying attention to some of this stuff because I can't yeah. get away with it anymore. And if I want to be lifting for the next, you know, 30, 40 years, you have to do some maintenance. There's no way, there's no way around it. You can't, you can't, uh, ignore it anymore. So I'm trying to find ways to, to start incorporating some of this stuff in my own training and start having that eye for longevity before it's too late, before it gets to the point where it's, you know, like you said, things are totally worn out and it, that's hard to come back from. Right. Definitely. Yeah. That's where you'll need intervention. So, I mean, I see, I, I just love when I see you climbing that rope. <laughs> that's, <laughs> 
that's a good way to keep things going. <laughs> oh, for sure. And you know, that's a, that's one I've, uh, I've actually, you know, had a, a few issues with too, um, is getting a little crazy with that one and, and doing it multiple times per week and sort of experiencing a little bit of, uh, pain and discomfort in my, my elbows and my biceps because of the amount of, um, you know, grip it takes, you know, to, to do that. It's very taxing. Um, so I, I mean, just kind of off the cuff here, would you have any recommendations with that in terms of what I can be doing to help with that, that elbow and forearm health for some of those heavier, you know, grip focused pulling movements, like, like a rope climb, for example, tendon, tendon work, we call it time under tension. So the tendon controls the muscle. That's, uh, that's why I like, uh, where you'll tear a tendon because that control gets broken. So say, uh, you know, I was putting my hands out to catch something you were going to give me and I go to catch it and it's heavier than I thought it would be. My hands will go like this, boom, right? Like I catch it and normally it doesn't tear, right? And sometimes, you know, you go to catch it, it was heavier than you thought, catches you off guard and boom, you tear something, you pop. That's because you haven't trained your tendons. So the tendon, it's time under tension going back to isometrics, but a very specific way to do isometrics. Like that's just kind of a general term, like this is very specific programming. So if like for anything for climbing, um, I do this stuff for people for jujitsu as well, all the twisting and uh, gripping, uh, and they get pain in their elbow, their wrist, their fingers. Um, so I do tendon work, time under tension. We're talking two minutes plus of doing different holds and movements programming the tendon to thicken or to be able to take the load. So what happens with a lot of uh, power lifters and um, bodybuilders is their, the actual belly of the muscle, the muscle tissue outgrows the tendon. It's, it's ahead of the tendon. So they're loading, their muscle can take it, but the tendon hasn't uh, kept up with it. And that's why they get like pec tears and bicep tears are pretty common because they're not training the tendons. And then if they're on, um, and that's important to know, sorry, just, just cut you yeah. off right there. But, um, most people don't realize that, um, the muscle will grow at a much faster rate than tendons because the tendons don't really get as much blood flow. They don't get as much nutrients. It takes them Correct. a much longer time. So especially if you, especially if guys who are, uh, you know, juiced up. I've seen that. I've seen that over the years is they're, they'll get really strong, really fast. Their muscles will, but their tendons are there. And, and before they know it, just they'll tear a, tear a bicep or, or tear a pec pretty easily just because yes. everything hasn't grown at the same rate. And then when you're, you're having those, um, you know, exogenous hormones and whatnot, your muscle will grow at a f even faster rate than it would normally. So you outpace pretty quickly that, that those tendons. Definitely. And depending on their programming, whatever other medications they might be using, uh, sometimes it affects uh, the tendinous uh, fibers itself, right? It almost like it'll dry it out. Uh, so that you have to consider that taking you back to proper nutrition to support it. But yeah, uh, anyone that has um, pain in the elbows, the fingers, the hands, the wrists, I think I just posted some stuff um, over the last few weeks on that. It'll be tendon work and and uh, capsular work, joint work, because both of those are going to expand your ability to do whatever you want uh, with your musculature, right? So if you're trying to climb and it hurts, well, why don't we expand your ability to pronate, supinate, and then let's work on the muscles, the rotational muscles that are just outside the joint or part of the joint. Um, so you have more control of those small nuanced movements and then the bigger muscles are are backing up your place, so to speak. But everything is in is is aligned. The joint can take the movement you're asking it to do. It has the capacity. Plus, you've built a cushion. That's the idea. Is you want to you want to have a cushion. So it's people that are strong, they're flexible, they're mobile, but they don't have an extra cushion for the time that you went to reach up for the rope. I'm just going to use that for an example. You know, you reach up for the rope, you don't quite grip it, and you and you you must have been climbing a rope where you don't quite get the grip you want mm -hmm. and you're like struggling it'll be in that struggle that you if you didn't have the buffer that's where the injury comes it's where mm -hmm. you're sore or you get the tear or the pop so yeah that would be my strong suggestion is uh is a very specific approach to tendon strengthening understanding 
uh, the tendon, the origin, and the attachment, like knowing where it starts, where it ends. If you have pain in those areas, then that's a no-brainer. Then you should address it, right? And then you you put it under tension progressively until it can take uh, better messaging to the muscle. Yeah, that's, and this is a perfect example of uh, you know, uh, sort of the red lights flashing on the dashboard, um, and because I'm I have a pretty pretty high pain tolerance. Um, as well. So, you know, whether my forearm or my elbow is kind of achy, I'm still going to, I'm still going to train anyways. I'm not going to be like, oh, I don't feel like it today, right? I'm just going to go do it anyways. Cause I, I do have a pretty high pain tolerance. Um, so yeah, that's it's something I have to work on before it, it gets to the point where it's really not good. So I think I saw you posted the other day, some of the, um, sort of the pronation and, and supination with a band, yeah. right? I think that was the one, yeah. um, that's something I definitely need to start incorporating. Yeah, you might be, you know, it might be mildly nice, surprising, like how effective it works. I usually with tendons, like tendons can heal actually pretty fast, like two, three weeks. They can actually be a pretty good healing process as long as you have a good diet. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but over the course, like just say an average person, you know, if they do their exercises, their movements, they have the right focus, six weeks, you can get tendon change, right? And then as long as it's just always incorporated somewhere in your work week where you actually do, like I said, joint work, tendon work, you're aware of it, you're aware of your body, you're aware of those pain points, and then you examine where is my pain? Is it in the belly of the muscle? Is it capacity in the sense of the fiber? Is it just like I'm sore because of growth, like I'm pushing my muscles? Or is this this, this constant nagging kind of pain or discomfort? And then again, that will allow you to be very specific in your training. Most people don't have specificity in their training or periodization. They don't like cycle their workouts. I see them, they just go in uh, and just do whatever, put the pin wherever, where I'm a dork. I have like my little notebook, notepad, who I, I used to make fun of those people. I thought like, who are those people? Mm -hmm. Now I'm like, it's like, I get upset if like my book fell out of my bag and I don't have my books like, oh, I wasted this whole day, you know? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I'll just check my book if I'm on a maintenance, you know, I just, I just brush through, match my numbers. No guess. I usually remember, like I'm a pretty good remembering. Um, and, and you don't have to have maximal lifts. Like, you don't, I'm not telling someone that's like, 60 to like go out and like blow their pecs out but what i'm saying is it it's if you do go and, and have a maximal lift and you're good with that maximal lift then everything around that's just maintenance how do i keep that just like um if i'm working with an athlete i'm not doing maximal lifts in the middle of his season that's crazy yeah you get hurt right mm -hmm. we do all that preseason. we get new 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 range new strength you know, some new growth, all of that stuff. We do all the work before they go, but then we build a routine for them to maintain it, to maintain what they have, maintain the lifts that they have, the strengths. Uh, so just, just stuff like that. Like I, I think even your average person would get so much more for longevity if they had that kind of understanding. You know, don't just go to the gym and move. It's great that you move and, and you're ahead of the game of most, but if you actually just apply just a little bit more specificity, into what you want to achieve i mean you're just going to get gains gains in every which way yeah so i'm just gonna let you know i have about five minutes left yeah we'll cut it let's we'll do uh we'll do a part two i think we'll do uh yeah. nutrition part two um because that's a whole nother can of worms i want to get into um but yeah so that's that's uh that's good with the with the training that's powerful that's definitely something that i have to work on um when you're thinking about longevity, it's something you have to do. It's this, you know, mobility work and whatnot. It's, it's just, it's not really an option. Um, that's for sure. No, no, I, I just, even at good life where I sit, uh, for my, uh, I do abdominal work and all the, all those machines, a couple of machines and, um, just setups and it's directly facing where people stretch. And I see the same people every morning and they look the same. They do the same. Mm -hmm. There's no change. And I'm just like, like it's, it's not, it doesn't get better. It gets worse. Mm -hmm. if you don't know what you're doing. So that's why I'm saying if you, if you latch onto some, some specificity, really key word, really specific in your approach, you can at least hold on to your gains. 
But as, you know, life throws its curveballs at you, maybe some injuries, maybe some change at work, some stress, who knows, can't always go to the gym. If you were never specific, you, you don't even know what you're losing. You don't even know what to hold on to. And then one day you wake up and you think you're old and broken where you could have fixed that, you know, or at least addressed it somewhere. Oh, for sure. Yeah. yeah. And, and one of the things too, that, uh, you know, why I'd recommend anyone, um, who is looking for, for treatment to kind of, you know, seek you out is it's so important for someone who's, um, a more in more of the athletic population who, who trains and whatever to, to find someone to help them. Um, you know, whether they're looking for some kind of, you know, chiropractor work, uh, you know, um, physical therapy, whatnot, to find someone who understands an athlete and understands lifts. That's so important. That was something when like early on, when I was dealing with some shoulder injuries and, and stuff like that, trying to ex like explain something to someone who doesn't train is so difficult. Right. Yeah. Whereas like, Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm working on a front lever and I, and I, and I'm feeling the pain here. He's like, okay, I know what, I know exactly what it is. Right. I know it's this yeah. lat it's whatever. And they just know. And, and so to find someone like that is so important. And I still, I, I haven't found anybody out here since I moved to Edmonton that, uh, can meet those needs. So I, I do, I need to do a little bit more searching. So if you come across anyone out there in the Edmonton area, let me know. Um, you should check out the, um, the functional range systems, uh, directory. Just okay. Click on it. I would say that's probably your best bet. If you got someone out there, um, just because you, you already have a really good knowledge background, you're already into it. Um, you'll just be able to soak up the information. Exactly. I'm very confident that you would be able to actually apply it, apply it to people that you trade, apply it to yourself. Uh, that's that's how I started. I had a, a trainer who's a functional range uh, systems trainer, and then he eventually was like, "You need to go get certified yourself because like, I can't I can't give you any more." But uh, yeah, I think you would absolutely flourish with uh, just kind of just the very specific way they approach it. And then programming, it just, yeah. I found it mind blowing. It, it was a life changer. Like I said, it saved my life, saved my joints. Um, that's what I would end with. Yeah. Is, uh, check out that directory, see it, add it to your game. You'll see your game just go. That's what it's all about. And I expect Reading. you to climb that rope backwards, feet first. <laughs> oh yeah. We're just, we're just getting started, brother. Trust me. Just getting started. <laughs> That's oh, yeah. awesome. Okay. So, um, yeah, so we'll end it here. We'll come back. We'll do a part two, uh, sometime soon. I want to get, okay. pick your brain on nutrition. Cause that's a, a whole nother, a whole nother thing, a whole nother can of worms okay. that we can get into. So I hope so. Yeah. Cause uh, a lot of contention there too. A lot of interesting, fun stuff to oh, talk that's, about. That's where the spicy stuff is. That's yes, what, I, that's where people get upset and, and, and yes. join cults and, and whatnot. So that's, yes. that's the fun stuff. So if you don't mind me being a little spicy on the subject, Oh, let's do um, it. Uh, I'm, I'm pumped for that. Hell yeah. I really enjoyed this conversation. And, yep. and I'm, I'm honored that you give me this uh, opportunity. So thank you. Yep. I enjoyed it as well. So uh, let's do let's do more of it. So thanks. And uh, stay tuned for part two. Peace and love.